next speaker is going to arrive, so um, perhaps we can just open the dialogue and have sort of a community discussion in the meantime. If anyone has any topics they'd like to throw out, um, ideas, thoughts, processes, <coughs> anything goes. Floor's open. Yes? Um, it, it seems to me that um, I had a comment. I was going to say that uh, with respect to using um, entheogens as psychotherapeutic agents, um, just in case, as I listened to it, it seemed as though one could get the impression that you sh that a therapist would choose to either do uh, psycholytic therapy or psychedelic therapy or use this particular entheogen or others but what I've read from 
from Zeff and Stolarov and, and Groff and Claudio Naranjo is that uh, these responsible therapists would work with the client and just see him normally and do non-psychedelic therapy for a while and at some point if they see that the client I'm thinking Naranjo in particularly, he might use three or four different psychedelics with a single client over the course of several years, and, but it would probably be the case that two-thirds of his sessions would be non-psychedelic altogether. So a responsible therapist has at their fingertips a variety of possibilities, a whole palette of different entheogens and different ways of using them. Thinking of, of Groff's reports, the psycholytic, uh, would be the client would take the substance during a, uh, a therapy session because the dose was low enough that they were still essentially coherent and they would have a regular therapy session but the client would be particularly sensitized by, by use of the entheogen. Whereas the psychedelic session, the client is going to be totally tripped out, so they'll, they'll do the session by themselves, and then later the therapist will sit and discuss with them the results of the session. So there's, there's really quite um, a spectrum of possibilities available to a responsible therapist, but I seriously doubt that any uh, ethical and responsible therapist would consider that, uh, you know, I only do LSD therapy with everybody or something like that. That would be uh, inappropriate. And I think the idea here is also to say that, you know, the idea is to open up all possibilities for healing, not just say these ones are only the ones to work. But uh, one question I have, maybe you know as well the answer to it. Uh, I'm confused by the question. Personally, what's the difference between psycholytic and microdosing? Is there a range or are they kind of the same thing? Or no, microdosing is much lower. It's much lower. I mean, you, you mean John, James Adamant? Yeah, that's, 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 so the very, that's so there's not even any noticeable. Oh, so psycholytic is still noticeable. Yeah, it's still uh, microdosing. Psycholytic, I think it could be up 75 to 100 micrograms. Okay. Let's say that was, okay. Okay. That would be considered then 250 and up would be like psychedelic therapy. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I I that, that was the stage. James Fadden's microdosing is like 10, 10, 10 mics. Okay. Gotcha. So that, 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 that. Does anyone here have any good stories about any microdosing experiences <laughs> or that they've heard of friends of theirs that might have Yes. Yeah, um, you know, there have been a lot of anecdotal stories about the use of microdosing as a, uh, an aid to successful psychedelic aging. And, and I think my favorite model for that is Albert Hoffman, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, was evidently pretty open about his use of microdosing of LSD as he got older and of course he looked to be very old man. That was like one time, I remember five or something. 102. 102, okay. I saw him give a talk in Switzerland once and he was like 90 at the time. I saw that talk. He did, yeah, yeah. and it was, uh, I don't understand German, but it was amazing just to be able to watch him and how much power he brought to the stage and like just to be able to see him and not understand the words was almost more for me because I was able to really feel his presence in a sense that I wouldn't have been able to had I actually understood all the words. So. He's a lovely guy. Yeah. Yes. I, I have a friend who used uh, microdosing with psilocybin for cluster headaches, which he suffered from for about 10 years. And he never went more than a couple months without experiencing these cluster headaches. And um, after, and this is actually in New Zealand. And, uh, and then after he you know, bought, got a big amount, grinding them up, putting them into little pills and taking them like every other day or something. And not only did he stop his cluster headaches for like a whole year, mm -hmm. but he developed an interest out of nowhere with nothing more than a high school background in quantum physics and all of these different things. So I found that very fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I know I think right now they're doing research at Harvard on the same idea with cluster headaches and LSD and maybe so excited as well, I'm not sure. But that's also exciting to see the Harvard system. Yeah, I was curious just sort of practically, how would you how and where, and I guess if, in the United States right now, there are situations where someone can go to a therapist and have them accompany them in the moment, in the session, what you were talking about, Adrian, microdosing or otherwise. Does that, does that happen? And I mean, it, it happens, but uh, I'm, I'm not personally a therapist, so I don't know the tactics. Anyone that maybe, I'm sure probably it's one of those underground things. Yeah, like I mean, not specifically where, you know, but like... But yeah, I mean, uh, it definitely happens, and I think it's definitely word of mouth, and I think there are specific people, uh, you know, they pick up on pan that are probably working in that area, but they keep it really quiet. Um, I'm guessing it's probably more open here in California than other places, but I could be wrong about that as well. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, 
lot of sour ideas on that. And does anyone know without giving all the way too, too much information? Yeah. Well, I, again, yeah. from the, the client side, I can say that it's something that I've been seeking for quite a long time. And yeah, you don't just type in a web search. Someone I can, you know. <laughs> but I, I have been, you know, just for, for my favorite old garden variety depression, I've been working with a therapist. And then when he and I were uh, you know, stopping working together, and he was going to give me a reference, he had actually remembered that uh, we worked together eight, ten months maybe, and he had remembered back at the beginning of us working together that I had mentioned seeking mm. psychedelic therapy, and he then gave me the name of uh, someone to work with. And so when I contacted this other person, you know, obviously we had to do a little dance around it, but then. Um, we ended up doing, again, just regular talk therapy for many months, and we were going to do uh, a full day long uh, psychedelic session. It just didn't pan out, you know, circumstances changed. But that's how I got to it. But it, you know, it's super random and just luck in the draw and, you know, finding it that way. Do you have any hints for other people who are clients looking for that as ways to approach it, or you say you do this little dance? Is there, is there well, no, like I said, I mean, it's just each person that I've mentioned it to, they're like, oh, that's interesting, but they don't know anybody, or even if they do, they're not necessarily going to give that name. But sure. it's, again, it's just a crapshoot, and I mean, I was amazed that I even got to it, and then, you know, and some of it, I mean, even being connected to this campus, I have a friend who just graduated from here this past spring, you know, just knowing people in this community and all of the overlapping there, you know, you're eventually going to find people to work with that way. So. Some of it's just being lucky and being in California. And, you know. and it, it almost seems like it's easier to find ayahuasca circles <laughs> than it is to find a therapist that administer because of the licensure program that we should be talking about. Right. So people that want to do it and that are actually qualified within the Western context um, to do these types of experiences are just like so timid to even approach it. Right. And that's really unfortunate. Hopefully, you know, I mean, this is a, a little bit of something I'll talk about in my talk a little later on, but hopefully there will be the shift so that it won't have to won't have to be within this particular guideline. You can actually talk about these experiences outside of that context, and then we'll feel open up another avenue. Yeah. Yeah. This is hard. You know, this, I mean, keep hearing a theme come up. You have the sacred, you know, set the setting, you know, profane set the setting, you know. And it's like we bounce around in between these two things, and I think living in the middle of all that, you know, chaos in a way. Because there's a, you know, you go to a ceremony in a sacred set setting, you know, if you set it up that way. And you come back, and we're in a profane set setting here, you know. The, mm -hmm. So it's negotiating it. It's, it's it's really difficult, you know. You know, given the laws, and, you know, ideology, and, you know, stuff. So yeah. it's, it's a challenge. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting because part of what drew me to this conversation and psychedelics was the fact that it is underground and that it is illegal and that it's not mainstream. Mm -hmm. And also, I've noticed it in music, and I've noticed, noticed it in other spheres that things that start as underground or start as grassroots kind of things, whether they be illegal or not, usually certain movements eventually become mainstream. Mm -hmm. And then you look back and say, well, I remember before it became. And so, I guess at this point, I hope that this illegal underground aspect to psychedelics and temptations is becoming mainstream so that it can be accessible to us as a, as a legal, normalized option. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point. I think that's something that we all as researchers in a way are hoping for and also worried about at the same time. You know, thinking in the back of our heads, everyone that's in this underground scene, as soon as we hear about normalizing or screaming or anything like that, it's like, oh, what does that mean? What are you going to lose within that context, you know? Uh, but I think this is really important. We need to talk about this because, you know, it's about, you know, giving options for people and, you know, good options that have been available to us since the beginning of time. The plans that you're already going to have to do, so why not have that option for people to do And I think, you know, um, you know, just something that we have to be cautious of as we watch these um, you know, experiences become more mainstream and mainstream universities doing this research is just to kind of keep these dialogues going, understand that there's no, you know, there's difference between sacred and profane, et cetera, et cetera, and just how do we sort of 
keep a watchful eye on the mainstreaming of these um, substances. And uh, Robert Forte was actually talking at our symposium last year, and he was mentioning um, you know, the, the somification of psychedelics right now. And he kind of had a really provocative thing to say about MAPS, basically saying that you know, MAPS is, um, you know, they're treating PTSD, so they're basically putting a bandage over an issue that really needs to be treated elsewhere, i.e. why are we going to war and causing these you know, veterans to have this trauma. And we're not dealing with that issue, which is really not really that issue. So how do we both bring these to the mainstream, but then really dig at what the, the issues are that are causing the trauma in the first place? I think keeping that balance will also help us through this process of I want, to, I want to jump back to your question really quick. The best luck that I've seen for myself and my colleagues is rather than creating an, an ethical quandary where you're going to sit with a client when they're in an altered state, is instead doing collateral sessions before the session to help them find a person in their life who can serve as that guide for them. And then bringing that person into the therapeutic room and exploring what do you want this person to do when this happens? What do you want this person to do when that happens? What do you want out of this experience? What are you hoping a guide will serve for you? And that lets you be in the room with this person who's having an experience without having the risk associated with living in a country that's dumb about drugs. <laughs> I, also, I just wanted to uh, also add um, another place that can be uh, a, a place where you can find um, sources for this kind of work is also you know drug positive uh, spaces. So you know in the in the club scene or the, the festival scene, they'll have organizations like Dance Safe or Jam Care or the, the, the Zendo Project, the Tea House. The tea house. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these projects uh, all uh, they're, they're 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 geared around providing that. Um, that support in like the, 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 the rave culture, the dance scene, uh, where you know substances are, are taken, so they, they they offer that support. So that can be a way to kind of network with people that are you know uh, on the positive side of use. Um, I actually had a really interesting um, conversation with someone out of Jam Care, uh, who you know, was actually an EMT, uh, but just that he was a Jam Care showed this this openness, and then it was yeah, it was like a network of the work. So um, it's not like a drop-in clinic, but <laughs> and I think this is really interesting too, is that you know there's sort of this intuitive development of the need, you know, necessity brings invention, right? So how is it that we have these festival cultures and people like Annie or in the full circle tea house that is like saying, hey, there's a space that's needed for these people that are having these intense experiences for them to come and disconnect and ground and like be safe in a place that isn't you know medical or you know from a different paradigm. You know, and so, and so I think it's really beautiful to see how there's this development within the Western model, but there's also this development in the underground Western model because it's a need, because it's a present in their face, and you know, every one of us that's gone to a festival has seen issues, and so it's nice that people like any other people are creating these tea houses and other things to bring people together, create community, and you know, just be able to have that community aspect that just brings so much more, and it gets rid of some of that paranoia of wanting to do something illegal or something bad that come here, so I think it's really great to watch them, these sort of Simultaneous developments of these strategies. Anyone else? Yes. <coughs> from one direction, but I have trouble access. 
using the empty space in my dreams. I don't usually have these crazy phantasmic or otherworldly multi-dimensional dreams, but I have access to dreams from those otherworldly multi-dimensional places. So, so I mean, I think you know we're still learning about what these things are too. So once this research really starts opening up, I think it's going to be exciting. So um, I'm just going to say thank you very much for our little dialogue. Our next speaker is here, so we'll give them a moment to set up, and, uh, and then we'll have another.